a lot. So do you hear me well or should I speak up? I'm usually known to be very loud during the talks, so yeah. Uh, so during the last lecture, Daniel uh, showed you how to prove that various problems are probably not in FPT. Yes, they are so-called W1 hard or W2 hard or whatever. So during this talk, I will give you a different paradigm, a more precise paradigm for uh, proving lower bounds uh, for complexity of various problems, namely the exponential time hypothesis. So let me give, start with some, uh, some basic motivation first. So let's look at our favorite uh, NP hard problem for the purpose of this talk, let's assume that a Hamiltonian cycle is my favorite NP hard problem. And what is the complexity status of this problem that we know? Okay, so from the algorithmic point of view, so if you just enumerate all possible cycles, yeah, this is n factorial, this is a brute force solution. But if you do standard dynamic programming on subsets, so vertically for every subset you remember whether there exists a, a walk for a, a path from this vertex to this vertex, and you do this dynamic programming, then already in the 70s, Held and Carp observed that you can do it in uh, 2 to the n time. So this O star throughout this talk, let me just write it down for the uh, for the record, that whenever, this is this convenient notation, that whenever I write O star of, of some function of k or n, this is the same as saying f of k times polynomial in the input size. Yes, just to abbreviate this polynomial in FPT uh, running times to make uh, the notation a little bit more concise. Yes? So in roughly 2 to the n time times some polynomial factors, you can solve this problem, which is substantially better than this. Yes? Can you do a little bit better? Actually, you can. So the currently fastest algorithm for the Hamiltonian cycle in the undirected graphs uh, is due to Andreas Brioklund from 2010. It runs in roughly running time 1.657 to the power n. Yeah? So given the state of the art, what is known from the point of view of lower bounds? Yes? So under the sheer assumption of p not equal to np, because the problem is np hard, you can say that it doesn't have a polynomial time algorithm. Right? But there's a huge gap between no polynomial time algorithm and exponential complexity. Yes? Meaning there are a lot of functions in between. For example, is this constant given by uh, Bjorklund tight? Maybe one can get a running time, say, square root of 2 to the power n, or 1.0001 to the power n. Or maybe you can do even substantially uh, faster algorithm. Uh, for example, running time, say, 2 to the order of n over log n, or even 2 to the square root of n. Yes, there's a multitude of functions between running time roughly 2 to the n and running time uh, polynomial. Yes? And the sheer assumption of p not equal to np seems very weak for such uh, investigation, yeah? Because it can only say whether it's polynomial time or probably not polynomial time solvable, yes? Exponential. So we need a more robust assumption, a more precise assumption, uh, assumption to reason about the difference between this kind of running times, yes? And this in particular applies to all these results that we had uh, in parameterized complexity. We have already seen today many different FPT algorithms with many different running times. Most of them had the standard running time, some constant to the power k, or equivalently 2 to the power order of k. Yes? But you can also get FPT algorithms with running time 2 to the roughly square root of k, or say 2 to the k square, or k to the k square, or doubly exponential in k, and so on and so on. Yeah? These are qualitatively different FPT running times, yes? And the core assumption that we have in parameters complexity, FPT is not equal to W1, only tells you that probably, well, doesn't distinguish all, any of them. M even more, if you look at the XP algorithm, so the run where the running time is of the form n to some function of the parameter, yes? These are also like substantially different, uh, different running times, yes? qualitatively uh, different running times. And if we prove that a problem of our interest is W1 hard, then probably we know that there is no FPT algorithm, yes? But distinguishing running time n to square root k from running time n to k, uh, order of k, yes? 
it seems very difficult under just the assumption of FPT not equal to W1. Yes? Good. So, yes, so we want some more precise assumption to reason to have, to have finer lower bounds on complexity of different problems, both in terms of like standard complexity theory and in terms of parameters complexity. And the goal in here is to create so-called fine-grained complexity theory, which means that we want to get a really good and precise bounds on the com complexity of problems that we are trying to solve. Yes, both from the upper bound and from the lower bound as well. Okay, so the base of our assumption exponential time hypothesis will be complexity of the free set problem, similarly as with, uh, with P versus NP pr uh, paradigm. Yes, so just to recall, uh, in the free set problem we are given, uh, given a formula in, uh, of propositional logic in uh, free CNF, say with n variables and m clauses, Yes, and we ask whether this formula is satisfiable, which means whether I can evaluate the variables to true or false so that, uh, so that all clauses are satisfied. So to give you an example, free CNF means that my formula is in the following form. It is a conjunction of clauses, yes? And each clause is a disjunction of at most three literals. Yes, so a formula could look like this. this here are three variables, x1, x, x2, and x3. These are three clauses. Yes, so they need to be simultaneously satisfied because they are conjuncted here, yes? And this clause is satisfied if x1 is true, or x2 is true, or x3 is false. Yes, and I ask whether I can give a true-false table for all the variables that satisfies all of them. Good, so the trivial algorithm to decide this problem is to do the end, yeah? Go through all the possible evaluations, yes? However, already after the talk of further today, you could come up with a smarter solution. Namely as follows. Let me take any clause that is not satisfied so far. Yes? It has at most three variables. Yes? There are seven assignments of those variables that make this clause satisfied. Yes? One is excluded because this is the one that does not satisfy it. Yeah? So let me branch on those variables. Yes? So I branch into seven possible directions into seven pro possible sub-problems, in each fixing one of those ev evaluations that satisfy this clause. Yes? After I fixed evaluation of those variables, I can reduce them from other clauses. Yes? Whenever a clause is satisfied, I just remove the whole clause. Whenever there is some literal that got not satisfied in some other clause, I just remove this literal. Yes? So th in this way, I can simplify the instance and proceed. Yes? So, we branch into seven options for every clause that we branch on, yes? Which leads to running time seven to power n over three, because we reduce the number of clauses, the number of variables by three whenever we are doing branching, yes? So we have bounded depth bounded by n over three, and at each step we have seven options, yes? If we had here eight to power n over three, you get exactly two to the n, and this would be functional equivalent to just brute force. Yes, but 7 to n over 3 is actually a little bit better. Yes? So this is a very simple um, improvement. Actually, you can do much better. So the currently best algorithm works in running time 1.308 to power 9. This is the fa famous PPSV algorithm. It actually is not branching. It is a much smarter idea. Maybe Daniel at some point will be talking about s stuff similar to this. Okay, so using the same trick for every Q, whenever you're looking at QSAT, where the length of the clause is bounded by Q, yes, you can do some improvement. Yes, so you, you can get separated by t from 2 to the n. So you can get running time 2 minus epsilon Q to the n. Yes, but this improvement diminishes with larger and larger Q. Yes, so so far we cannot get better significantly uh, than 2 to the n for all different queues. Yes? Okay, so this is the state of the art. So this state of the art sort of suggests two hypotheses. Yes? So two questions. First of all, can we do significantly better for FreeSat? Can we get a sub-exponential algorithm for FreeSat? 2 to the small o of the number of variables. Yes? So far we had an improvement in just the base of the exponent, but we are very far from getting something significantly better. Second, 
if I do not have any bound on the length of the clauses, yes, so I'm concerned with arbitrary CNF as problem, yes? Can I do anything better than the brute force going through all the possible to do the n evaluations? Yes? So given these two research questions, which are we are sort of very far from uh, from solving, they suggest two natural uh, definitions for exponential time hypothesis and strong exponential time hypothesis. These are not the exact statements, but these are like first attempts. And functionally, when you talk to people, this is basically what people think is actually ETH and strong ETH. Yeah, so ETH says that just free sat is not solvable in sub-exponential time in terms of the number of variables. Yes. And strong ETH says that CNF sat, so without any bound on the length of the clauses, cannot be done in some alpha to the n time for any alpha that is smaller than, that, than 2. Yes? OK, so these are like formally correct research statements. Yes, correct scientific statements. It turned out that actually these two statements are not really robust with respect to different reductions. Yes, so the actual statements are a little bit more formal, not that much more formal, well, not that much more complicated. OK, so let me look at QSAT, the complexity of QSAT, for some Q larger or equal than 3. Yes? So let me think about all the possible Cs for which there is a 2 to the Cn algorithm. Maybe there is a 2 to the n algorithm for C equal to 1. Maybe there is a 2 to the po point 0.5 n algorithm. Maybe a little bit smaller, and so on and so on. Yes? And let delta Q be the infinimum of all those Cs. Yeah, so the sort of best possible exponent, best possible constant standing here in the exponent for an algorithm of QSAT, for QSAT. Yes? So the exponential time hypothesis says simply that delta 3 is larger than 0. So just unraveling this definition, there exists some positive C for which you do not have an algorithm working in 2 to the Cn time. Yes? So it doesn't say that there is no sub-exponential algorithm. It says even something a little bit stronger, meaning that you cannot get arbitrary small exponential running time. Yes? For strong exponential time hypothesis, or SETH, this just says that the limit of all those savings is 1. Yes? Which means that as Q grows larger and larger, yes, you cannot avoid doing brute force enumeration in some sense. Yes? So the, uh, the savings that you can get g diminish uh, to zero. Yeah? So observe that these statements are actually possibly stronger than our first attempts, yeah? because here we are talking about complexity of Q sat for larger and larger Q, and not for CNF sat with unbounded uh, clause length. Yes? And here we are talking about the non-existence of some non not possibility of solving it in some exponential running time instead of sub-exponential running time. Yes, but however, functionally, these statements, o the, the original statements are often uh, enough to prove uh, to, to exclude some algorithm. Yes. Uh, note that in this definition, I did not tell you what is an algorithm. And this is somehow non-trivial sometimes. Uh, you either say that algorithm must be deterministic, or you may assume that this algorithm for solving QSAT uh, could be, say, randomized with two-sided error. Yeah? In this way, you get a randomized ETH. Yeah? I think that the most robust way is to just assume that this algorithm here can be randomized, because most of the uh, current state-of-the-art algorithms for solving SAT are actually randomized algorithms. Uh, OK, so as the name suggests, strong ETH implies ETH. However, this is a non-trivial fact. Meaning if you just sit down and try to work it out, it will not work. Meaning you need to have more insight. Uh, we will actually not prove it. So some history. These two hypotheses, as stated here, were formulated by Impagliazzo, uh, Paturi, and Zayn in 2001. Uh, so some time ago already. And since then, it really kick-started this, uh, this optimality program or fine-grained complexity theory, because it turned out that these are actually two very nice, robust assumptions for proving complexity lower bounds. And yes, so nowadays, there are standard assumptions that uh, if you want to have a precise bound, you assume those, uh, any of those. So about the believability of those, uh, those assumptions, so ETH is sort of, I would say, sort of believed. For strong ETH, people discuss. 
let's say. Um, I don't know, meaning it is a convenient assumption to, 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 to state because sort of if you, at least if you prove something under strong ETH, you say if I make a progress in this problem, I would actually make a significant progress in the most important problem in the world, sort of. Yes. Good. So now that we have complexity assumptions, we can transfer hardness. And as usual in complexity theory, you transfer hardness via reductions. Yes? Uh, so the idea is similar with <coughs> NP completeness. Yes? So what is uh, NP completeness, uh, NP hardness uh, uh, reduction? You just say that a too fast algorithm for the target problem combined with the reduction would actually uh, give me a too fast algorithm for the source problem. Yes? So let's look at our favorite example today, namely vertex cover that you have seen already, I think, uh, three or four times, I guess. Yes? So just to recall, I've got a graph, I've got an integer k, and I want to find k vertices in my graph that cover all the edges in a sense that an edge is covered when at least one endpoint is taken. Good. So let's look at the standard NP hardness reduction for vertex cover. Yes? So it goes from free sat to vertex cover. I've got an instance of free sat with n vert variables and m clauses, and I create the following gadgets. For every variable, I create an edge with one endpoint labeled with the positive literal of this variable and one endpoint labeled with the negative uh, literal. And for every clause, I create a triangle. So if this triangle corresponds to clause x1 or not x2 or x3, then let me label its vertices like this. Yes? And now I just connect all the vertices labeled with certain literal with the corresponding vertex in the variable gadget. And that's the end of the, of the reduction. I claim that the initial, the original instance of free set is satisfiable if and only if this graph admits a vertex cover of size n plus 2m. So let's analyze it for a moment. Observe that from each of those edges, I need to pick one vertex, at least. From each of those triangles, I need to pick at least two vertices. And I've got budget for the vertex cover n plus 2m. So this is tight. So I need to pick exactly one guy from, from, from each of those edges and exactly two from those. Yes? OK, so this means that for every variable, I have a choice. I either take positive instance or the negative instance, P positive literal or the negative literal. And now if you look at this triangle here, yes, if I simultaneously pick the wrong guys, making this class not satisfiable, not, not satisfied, this means that in this triangle, I cannot pick two vertices in order to cover all those three edges. On the other hand, if any of those is taken, then in the triangle, I just take the, the complement to. Yes? So this is the most standard reduction for the vertex cover problem. So let's analyze it. So let this capital N be the number of vertices in the, in the output instance. And this is like 2N plus 3M, right? So this is linear in the number or in the total size of the input formula, which is the number of variables plus the number of clauses. Yes? So naively, the number of clauses in a free set formula is at most cubic in the number of variables, yeah? because there are cubic number of possible clauses. Yes? So the size of the output is like n cubed, where n is the number of variables. OK, so if I had an algorithm working at running time, say, 2 to the small o of cube root of n, capital N, for the target vertex cover problem, then I would get a sub-exponential algorithm for the for free set, right? Because I would just combine the reduction, compose the reduction with this algorithm, yes? And then uh, cubic root of n cube is is small is 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 at most n, and here I've got small o, yes? However, this there is still a big gap, yeah? Because we do not know any sub-exponential algorithm for uh, for vertex cover in terms of the number of variables uh, of, of, of vertices, and we got a much weaker lower bound. Yes? So the problem here is that we've got this naive cubic blow up. And the observation is that if I started with an instance of preset that is sparse, in the sense that the number of 
clauses is linear in the number of variables. Then here I've got, I would have linear in n, and everything would go work. Yes, I would have a lower bound uh, that would uh, uh, that would refute the existence of a sub-exponential algorithm for for vertex cover. Good. So for this, in Pagliazzo, Patur, and Zen, uh, they proved a basic result called specification lemma, which I will formulate formally in a minute. But informally and sort of functionally, it says that if you have an instance of QSAT for some constant Q, then you can preprocess it in sub-exponential time to make the number of clauses linear in the number of variables. Yes, to make it sparse in this sense. So this is the informal statement. The formal statement is the following. Don't read it so far. Now you can read it. Yes. So it says the following. I've got an instance of QSAT for some fixed Q with n variables and m clauses. Then let me fix some parameter epsilon larger than zero. This is a parameter this, this, that's a real that is as small as I wish. Yes. Now I can work in 2 to the epsilon n time, so in exponential time, but as small exponential as I wish, yes? And output 2 to the epsilon n instances of QC and Fsat on the same set of variables, yes? So again, this number is exponential, but as small exponential as I wish, so that this instance is satisfiable if and only if any of those is satisfiable. Formally, this instance is actually a disjunction of those instances because they are on the same vertex set, variable set. Uh, yes, and each of those output instances will have a linear number of clauses, yes, where linear is governed by this constant C standing in front of the bound on the number of clauses, which depends on the Q in the QC and F set and on the, on the epsilon that I wished for. Yes? So the smaller epsilon I wish for, the, la the, the more explosion I have in the number of clauses. Yes? This lemma is non-trivial, and uh, it is also not very hard. It is kind of a basic branching, but I will not cover it. Yes? You can, actually, it is not in the book, I think. So, but you can, you, can, you can check it in the original paper. Good, so let us use this as perfection lemma to show the following basic corollary that will be used throughout this whole talk. That if I look at the complexity of FreeSAT, but now measured not in the number of variables, but the number of variables plus the number of clauses, so the total length of the input, then I still do not have a sub-exponential algorithm in the following sense. There is a constant c larger than zero, such that I cannot get an algorithm running with running time to do the c times n plus m. Yes, for some small c, I do exclude such an algorithm. So let's prove this. Suppose by contradiction that I have, for all, c, for all positive c's, I have so those better and better exponential time algorithm for free set. Yes? So for every c, I've got an algorithm ac that solves free set in this running time. Yeah? So now, to contradict ETH, I need to devise an algorithm for any d larger than zero that solves free set in, in time 2 to the dn, where th now here I've got only the number of variables. Right? OK, so let's pick epsilon equal to d half. Yes? And let's apply the specification lemma. Yes? So I take the, instan the input instance of free set, yes? and I output 2 to the epsilon n uh, instances of QSAT, of FreeSAT, sorry, yes, which all of are sparse, yes? And now I know that for sparse instances where M is linear in N, I have very good algorithm, yes? So let me now solve each of those instances by my super nice algorithm AC prime, where C prime is actually something like this, yes? Note that here I divide by this linearity factor that I assumed, yes? OK, so the total running time of this algorithm, yeah, and now I output that the initial formula is satisfiable if and only if any of those was satisfiable. So the running time is as follows. First, I apply specification lemma, which runs in this running time. 
Yes? And then for 2 to the epsilon n instances of FreeSat, those sparsified, each of, them each of them is solved in this running time. Yes? Here I've got the C prime times n plus m. Yes? In the new instance. And n plus m is at most n plus cn. Yes? Because of the sparsification. Yes? So there's like C plus 1 times n. Now C plus 1 cancels out. Yes? I've ha got here actually d half plus d half. And this is running time to the dn. Yes? And this works for any d that I fix. Yes? OK, so this was a little bit technical, but sort of it shows that uh, it shows what we wanted. Yes, that with, with sub-exponential preprocessing, yes, we are able to say that my, 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 uh, my instance is actually sparse. Good. So there are two things that uh, I want you to remember of falsification lemma, the formal statement. First, that it does not work in sub-exponential time. It works in exponential time, but as small exponential as I wish. And second, it's a Turing reduction. Yes? It outputs many instances of QSAT instead of just one. Good. So the corollary is as follows. If I do have no exponential time algorithm for some small c, then in particular, I don't have a sub-exponential algorithm for FreeSAT. Right? In terms, now, of the number of variables plus the number of clauses. Yes? So the total input size. So now observe that our reduction from FreeSAT to vertex cover produced an output which had linear number of vertices and linear number of edges in terms of the whole input formula. Yes? So if you had an al a sub-exponential algorithm for vertex cover in terms of the number of ver vertices and plus the number of clauses, then by combining the reduction and this super nice algorithm for vertex cover, you would have an algorithm for FreeSAT that would be sub-exponential in the total input size. Yeah? Contradicting ETH. Good. Okay, so this basically shows you already how this transfer of hardness will be, will be working, yes? If I have a, any problem, this is like a standard problem, non-parameterized so far, yes? Where you have a reduction from FreeSAT where the blow up of the reduction is governed by this function f. So the total output size is bounded by f of the input size, where input is the number of variables plus the number of clauses. Yes? Then under ETH, you exclude an algorithm for the target problem with running time 2 to the small o of the inverse of f. Yes? Where the inverse is basically what you expect. Yes? The inverse of exponential function is logarithm, the inverse of quadratic function is square root, and so on and so on. Yes? So for linear reductions from FreeSAT, actually if you look at uh, the complexity of your literature and the standard NP-hardness reductions for various problems, mo many of them are linear. So for problems like feedback vertex set, or dominating set, or free coloring, or Hamiltonian cycle, all of them do not possess sub-exponential algorithm under ETH, because just the reduction is linear from FreeSAT. Yes? OK, however, this, this sort of rule of a thumb suggests that you can also prove more exotic lower bounds. Yes? Because maybe the, the, the instance blow up in the reduction is, say, quadratic, then you exclude an algorithm for running time to do the square root. So let's look at one such example. So consider the planar vertex cover problem. It's just the vertex cover problem that we all know and love, restricted to planar graphs. Yes? So let's inspect what the standard NP-hardness reduction for this problem does. It takes a standard instance of vertex cover on general graph. We know that this problem is NP-hard. You embed it in the plane. And of course, when you embed it in the plane, you ha can get some crossings. Yes? So whenever you have a crossing, you just replace it with this 22 vertices gadget. Yes? And basically, you then argue that the input instance had the vertex cover of size blah, if and only if this new graph have an instance uh, have a vertex cover of size blah prime. Yes? For appropriate blah and blah prime. Good, so let's analyze this reduction. 
Yes? So this reduction takes an instance of vertex cover on n var vertices and m edges. Yes? And introduces this crossing gadgets. So how many crossings there are? Well, at least at most quadratic number. Yes? For each crossing, I introduce 22 vertices, which is a constant number. Yes? So we out with an instance where the number of vertices is quadratic in the input size. So if now you had an algorithm for running time to do the small o of square root of the number of vertices for the planar vertex cover, you would immediately get a sub-exponential algorithm for the original vertex cover, yes, contradicting ETH. Yes? And observe that actually, well, observe. Actually, planar vertex cover has such an algorithm for running time to do the square root n. Yes? Uh, this is a first corollary of the so-called lipton tarjan uh, separator theorem that says that a planar graph on n vertices has a balanced separator of size square root n. So a separator consisting of square root n vertices, which splits the graph in a balanced way. And then you can div apply divide and conquer. A more modern way of saying this is that the planar graph of, of size n has true square root n, and then you can apply dynamic programming on graphs of bounded truth, which will be during Daniel's talk tomorrow. However, this means that we have tight bounds. There is an algorithm for running time 2 to the order of square root n, yes? And 2 to the small of square root n is excluded, yes? And this shows that the square root n in the exponent is not a coincidence. It's not an artifact of this, of this technique, yes? It is an inherent component of the complexity of the problem. Yes? Good. So now that, uh, so now that uh, uh, we are done with the exact exponential time algorithm, let's, uh, how much time do I have? So ten, ten minutes. Okay. I'll try to be quick then. <laughs> or maybe I'll just be more relaxed and skip some material. Okay, so now we are done with the exact uh, exponential time algorithm. Let's look at more parameterized setting, yes? So consider the click problem, yes? We are given a graph. We want to check whether it has a click on k vertices, yes? So the trivial algorithm n to the k, yes? Daniel already told you that you can do slightly better, yeah? The, there is this very nice algorithm of Neshet, Schill, and Polyak. And well, under the sheer assumption of FPT not equal to W1, you can exclude an algorithm that runs in FPT time. Yeah, but still, between this running time and this running time, there is a large gap. Maybe there is an algorithm with this running time. Yes? Now we will prove that this is actually not the case. That under the assumption of ETH, the click problem doesn't have an algorithm with this kind of running time, so with any sublinear dependence on k in the exponent, even if you allow arbitrary computable function in front. Yes? So in particular, this means that under the assumption of ETH, you do not have an FPT algorithm. So ETH actually implies that FPT is not equal to W1. OK, so now to prove this theorem, I will actually start not from free set, but from free coloring. It will be a little bit more convenient. For free coloring, we already know that there is no sub-exponential algorithm under ETH. Because there is a linear time reduction, I will not show it. Good. So how to, how to make a reduction from free coloring to click? So suppose that this is the input instance. This is a graph whose free coloring is in question. Yes? Let me divide it into k groups of vertices, each of size roughly n over k. Note that I did not specify k so far. I will specify it at the end. Now I create an instance of click as follows. For each group, being a column here, I look through, I iterate through all possible free colorings of this group, and I make one vertex only for those free colorings that are consistent, in a sense that there is no edge with both endpoints of the, in the same color within this group. For example, this vertex would correspond to, to such a coloring, and this vertex would correspond to such coloring of this group. Yes? So these are vertices of my graph. Now the edges. Whenever I have two colorings of two different groups, yeah, let me inspect them and see whether they are consistent with each other, whether the union doesn't have a two vertices of the same color joined by an edge. If so, I put an edge. And if not, 
then I make them an adjustment. So now it should be clear that if you have a free coloring here, this corresponds to a click here, because this Colorings are consistent within the groups and pairwise compatible. On the other hand, if you have a click here, then if you take the union of those colorings, you can easily see that this is a consistent coloring here. And this is because every edge either has two endpoints in the same group, and we have consistency within the group, or has endpoints in two different groups, and then we have compatibility between different groups. Yes? So let's look at the at the reduction that we have just shown, yes? So the output graph has a K click if and only if the input graph had a K, uh, was free colorable. And the number of vertices was well like K times 3 to the power N over K, yeah? It's huge, yes? However, if K is, sub, uh, is, is super constant, this is actually sub-exponential. Yes, this is the key. Okay, so let me put K equal to log N for a starter and assume that this click problem can be solved in time, say, 2 to the k times n to the small o of k. Now apply this algorithm to this, uh, to this output instance. Then we get running time. 2 to the k is actually n, because two to this 2 to the n log, uh, log n, this uh, 2 to the log n. This k to the or small o of k is actually some small factor. This is quasi-polynomial. Yes? And then we've got this huge factor, 3 to the n over k, to the power small o of k. So this results to 3 to the power of n over log n times small o of log n. So this is actually 2 to the small o of n, this is sub-exponential, because we have this log n cancelling out, right? So we would get a sub-exponential algorithm for the free coloring problem, yes, if supposing this. Now if I take k equal to log log n, I can similarly exclude a running time of this form, yes? It's just that I need to take k sufficiently small to kill this f of k factor in, in, in front here, yes? Again, here I would have small o of log log n divided by uh, log log n cancelling out and giving me some, uh, some improvement. Okay, so if you now replace this 2 to the k, 2 to the 2 to the k with arbitrary function f, then actually you need to take k being a sort of inverse of n uh, under this function f. There are some technical difficulties regarding the computability of this, one, but let me, let me ignore them. But let me give the intuition of what actually happened. In free coloring, we have the search space of all possible free colorings of the graph. Yes? And in the k-click problem, we have the search space of all possible k-tuples of vertices. What we did, we sort of took the first search space of size 3 to the n, we chopped it into pieces and embedded it into the other search space, intuitively. And which proves that the necessity of iterating through the initial search space implies the necessity of iterating through the whole uh, target search space. Yes? So all these reductions between different running times and different, uh, different complexities, at least in my head, is just trying to embed one search space whose uh, searching is, seems inevitable yes, to another one. Good. So now, if I have already hardness of click, yes, I can do... Yes. So you envisioned that exploring the search space of the original mm -hmm. forces, if that was necessary, then it would also be necessary to explore. Yes, because if you could do something smarter for the other search space, by combining the reduction with the, this something smarter, would give something smarter in the origin. And where does the parameterize, where does the chopping up stuff come in there in this situation? I, I don't have any there, so... I'm not sure if I am able to convey it uh, in, in a succinct way. Good. Okay, so if I now have a hardness for click, I can take W hardness reductions that Daniel provided you and I can transfer it to other problems. And again, if I have some, uh, some reduction with some parameter blow up, this gives me some lower bound. Yes? If I have a reduction where the parameter 
is transformed linearly, this gives me this kind of a lower bound for the target problem. If I have a reduction with quadratic blow up, then I can exclude algorithm with, with this kind of running time. Yes, because an al if I had a reduction with quadratic blow up of the parameter and this kind of running time for the target problem, then combining the two, I would get a better algorithm for the click problem. Yes? So actually, let me skip it, but there are problems where this kind of running time is surprisingly tight, and not surprisingly, they are on planar graphs. Good, so let me sort of finish with uh, saying what actually happens for parameter's complexity. Yes? So uh, in parameter's complexity, we are mostly concerned about FPT problems. Yes? And in FPT problems, there is this component f of k, which governs the dependence of the running time on the parameter k. Yes? And we would like to understand really well how this f of k uh, I mean, get tight bounds on it, yes? So already for simple problems like vertex cover, this already follows from the standard and Cardinal's reduction, yeah? If you have no sub-exponential, if you have no sub-exponential in n uh, algorithm, then in particular, you don't have sub-exponential in k, because k is at most n, right? This is trivial. Similarly, for the planar vertex cover, you do not have 2 to the small of square root k, because you do not have even 2 to the small of the number of vertices. Yeah, to the small of square root of the number of words. Yes? These are actually tight. You have FPT algorithm with this running times. Yes? However, if you want to prove hardness for this f of k term, yes, it is too much to expect that the whole instance size will be, will be actually linear, for example. Yes? You are measuring the complexity in terms of the uh, of in terms of the parameter, yes? So even if you have a reduction that works, say, in polynomial time, the output instance is polynomial, not necessarily linear, but the parameter is linear in the total input size, then you even then exclude a sub-exponential sub in k algorithm, yes? For example, if the output instance is polynomial in the input, and k is linear in the input, then still a running time, an FPT running time of this form, Yes, for the target problem would give me a sub-exponential algorithm for the original problem. Yes? But st so this means that, again, you have this, this lemma about the transfer of the, of the hardness. If you have a reduction from FreeSat with this kind of parameter blow up, and you had a better algorithm for the uh, th then you can exclude an algorithm with this kind of running time for the target problem. So quadratic blow up gives you square root, yeah? Square root blow up gives you quadratic lower bound and so on. Because combining the reduction and a better algorithm for the target problem would give you a better algorithm for, for that. Uh, good. For many problems, the situation is simple. Namely, you just look at out of the shelf uh, reduction and it gives you tight bounds, yes? However, there are some uh, more exotic running times in FPT field for which you can prove, uh, for which you can prove uh, hardness. Uh, for example, if you look at those slightly super exponential running times, so of the form two to the order of square, uh, two to the order of k log k, which is like k to power order of k. Yes, these they, these algorithms appear naturally in the FPT field. For example, when you are doing the branching procedure that instead of, that has a tree of depth k, roughly k, yes? However, at every step, instead of branching into two or three possibilities, it branches into poly k possibilities, yes? Then the whole branching tree has size k to the k, yes? So for this running times, you can also give a methodology for proving lower bounds. So let me just flash it. What you do, you look at the following k times k click problem. This is very similar to what we have done. The input is a k times k grid, yes, a graph on a k times k grid. And I ask whether there is a click consisting of one vertex at a row. Yes? And this algorithm has this problem has a trivial k to the k algorithm. Yes? by just iterating through all the options. Yeah? For every row, I need to pick one of the, of the vertices, yes? one of the k vertices, yes? so I can iterate through all options. Yes? Uh, and the intuition is that this is very similar to the click problem, because in the click problem, you have k options, one in n, to choose from. 
Now we have k options 1 and k. So if you now take the reduction that we already had for the click and you apply it for k being roughly n over log n, if you work out the details, you show that this running time is tight. You cannot get a better algorithm than 2 to the small of k log k. Yes? And again, once you have this archetypical problem for k independent choices 1 in k, you can transfer hardness via reductions to some other problems that let me skip. Okay, this one I will skip as well. Uh, and let me go to the conclusions. Oh, no, let me go to the strong ETH to just mention what will be happening on Tuesday. So in the beginning, I defined what is ETH, uh, and I mentioned also strong ETH, which basically says that when Q, the allowed length of a clause, goes to infinity, yes, the complexity of, of, of QSAT approaches more and more to 2 to the n. Yes? So ETH basically says something about the asymptotics of the exponent, whether the exponent of the running time should be linear or square root or quadratic or whatever. Yes? This assumption actually says something about the exact value of the coefficient in the exponent or equivalently on the exact value of the base of the exponent. Yes? So when you are doing ETH hardness, hardness under ETH, you care about the asymptotics of the blow up. We care whether the blow up is linear or quadratic or whatever, yes? Now if you are doing reduction for strong ETH, it is crucial whether the new parameter is say 2k or 3k, because this directly affects the coefficient that you are caring about. Yes? So this means that lower bounds under strong ETH are much more technical and delicate and also much scarcer in the current uh, landscape. And Daniel will talk more about strong ETH and what you can derive from it on Tuesday. So to conclude, ETH, exponential time hypothesis, is a tool that is more precise than P not equal to NP that allows you to estimate what is the asymptotics of the, expo of the exponent for NP hard problems. Yes? Uh, it, the paradigm applies to many different fields, actually, not only parameter complexity, but mostly to just exponential time algorithms and also to W hard problems. In particular, ETH implies that FPT is not equal to W1. Yes? It is still an imprecise tool, meaning just saying that there is no sub exponential algorithm doesn't give you that much information about the complexity. Yes? And for and then you need stronger assumptions to, to say a little bit more. And all of this opens this field of fine-grained complexity theory where you are interested in getting matching upper and lower bounds for, for different kind of problems. Yes? And the main motivation is that if you force yourself to really understand what can be done and what cannot be done, yes, then you really understand how particular parameter affects the complexity of the problem. Yes? And byproduct is that by the systematic uh, investigation of this, you can actually get, and we did get, unexpected algorithmic results. Yes, so this applies not only to parameters complexity, but to more fields in general. And thank you for the attention. <laughs>